cannot please God without Jesus. That for you as a Christian may seem a very obvious thing, but if you're not a Christian, if you're not a sincere, genuine Christian, that may come as a shock to you. And yet, the Bible tells us this from cover to cover. We fall short of the glory of God. But with Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. My name is Rory McClure, I'm the pastor of this church, and I'd like to invite you to this, our worship service. We're going to be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and we're going to be listening to the commission that King David gave to his son Solomon, and gave him the responsibility to build the temple. And yet that temple never survived. But we as Christians today have a better temple. Our call to worship is Psalm 66. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honour of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Oh, bless our God, you peoples. And make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. What a wonderful God that we worship there. And we're going to celebrate that glorious God as we sing this, our opening hymn, Tell Out My Soul, the Greatness of the Lord. Will you bow your head and pray with me? Our God and Father, we come to you, almighty, everlasting, majestic and glorious God. We come to you full of need. We come to you, dear Lord, to hear from you, to rest in you, to find our strength and our hope in you. We pray, dear Lord, that you would be with us. 
We ask, dear Lord, that we would meet with Jesus and that we would, we would be strengthened by him. Oh, Heavenly Father, we dedicate this time to you. Whether we are in our kitchens or our living rooms, whether we are in our beds or wherever we're watching this, Lord, we pray that we would sense the power of your Holy Spirit challenging us, comforting us, and drawing us closer to our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm recording this in anticipation of Remembrance Sunday as we pause to remember the sacrifices of so many people that have died in too many wars. But we remember this in gratitude. The greater love has no man than this, that he lay, lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did that for us, but we also need to remember that in our country, many people laid, laid down their lives for our freedom. And so we're going to pause and we're going to observe the two minute silence and we're going to do this whether we're able to watch this precisely at 11 o'clock with the rest of the nation on Remembrance Sunday or whether you're able to watch this some other time of the week. I just hope and pray that you sense God's presence as we remember the fallen. <laughs>
we're going to sing our Remembrance Sunday hymn, Shall We Forget? Pray for our needs and the needs of our people in our families and in our fellowship and in our nation. Our God and Father, we come to you again. We come to you, dear Lord, with aches and pains, with frustrations, with heartaches, with aspirations, with dreams, with desires. We come to you, dear Lord, because you are a good God and you have given us so much. We thank you and praise you that on this Remembrance Sunday we can thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this country, for the peace and prosperity that we enjoy. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for your many, many mercies. But we again pray that you would bring peace. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We ask, dear Lord, that you would bring both parties to the negotiation table soon. We know that winter is coming. We know that people are dying. We know that millions of people in Ukraine are going to suffer because of the constant bombing and the closing down of the, uh, of the power stations and everything else. Life is increasingly miserable there and peace is needed. Dear Lord, please have mercy on them. Father, we pray for the other nations where there's war. We think of Syria. We think of Yemen. We think of East Africa. We think of Pakistan and other nations which are uh, uh, torn apart, uh, Myanmar, uh, so many different countries that have civil war, that have unrest. Oh, Heavenly Father, please, please have mercy on them. Prince of Peace, please reign over there. Give us the courage to speak out on behalf of these things. And, uh, and pl please, dear Lord, give us the courage to speak to our government that they may work for peace. Lord, we come to you with our personal needs and we again ask you to bring healing. We want to pray for a couple of people in our congregation that are recovering from hip and knee operations. Have mercy on them, dear Lord. I pray that they would receive strength and your healing. Show mercy to them and grace. We want to pray for those that feel lonely or lost, for those that are struggling with finances, have mercy on them, bring comfort and provision to them as well. 
Lord, we continue to pray that your kingdom would come. And part of that, dear Lord, we pray for our own needs as a congregation. Bless Parkside Evangelical Church. Provide for us as well, dear Lord. Show mercy to us. Dear God, you are a good God. Give us what we need to advance your kingdom. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing God's praises again as we sing, Come, O thou fount of every blessing. Will you sing this with me? Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let that grace now, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to Thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for Thy courts above We're turning in our Bibles this morning to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and this is a lovely chapter. If you've got a Bible anything like mine, and if you're anything like me, perhaps you enjoy uh, being able to underline your Bible. There's a uh, picture of my Bible, and it's underlined everywhere. Uh, because I find it really helpful to uh, meditate on God's word and to find important passages and particular, uh, particular phrases or verses that jump out at me. And in my Bible, this chapter is full of underlinings, those beautiful, precious uh, verses in this Bible. However, they're a little bit more challenging than we might initially think. Let's come to the word of God as we read 1 Chronicles chapter 8. We come to God in prayer. Pray with me. Our God and Father, your word is holy, just, and true. But we need your Holy Spirit to open up its truths and apply them to our own hearts and lives. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. The context is that the temple of Solomon needs to be built, and yet it hasn't been built. David is now commissioning his son. He's bought the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, He has prepared all of the materials and all of the uh, civil structures and all of the organizations that need to make the the temple function and for it to be built. And now this is David's commissioning speech to his son, Solomon. David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel, the officials of the tribes, the officers of the divisions that served the king, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, the stewards of all the property and the livestock of the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the seasoned warriors. Then David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for building, but God said to me, you may not build a house for my name, for you are a man of war and have shed blood. 
Yet the Lord God of Israel chose me from my father's house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader. And in the house of Judah, my father's house, and among my father's sons, he took pleasure in me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his kingdom forever, if, if he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, observe and seek out all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and give it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and, your, and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave Solomon his son a plan of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, his treasuries and its upper rooms, its inner chambers and of the room for the mercy seat. And the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the chambers and all the surrounding chambers and the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries for dedicated gifts, for the divisions of the priests and the Levites and all the work of the service, for the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of God, the weight of gold for all golden vessels for each service and the weight of silver vessels for each service the weight of the golden lampstands and their lamps, the weight of the gold for each lampstand and its lamps, the weight of the silver for a lampstand and its lamps, according to the use of each lampstand in service, the weight of gold for each table of the showbread, the silver for the silver tables, and the pure gold for the forks, the basins and the cups, the golden bowls and the weight of each, for the sil silver bowls and the weight of each, for the altar of incense, of refined golds and its weight, also his plan for the golden chariot of the cherubim that spread the wings of the covered ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord. All the work to be done according to the plan. Then David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God even my God is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until the work of the service of the house of God is finished. And behold, the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God and with you. All the work will be, ev uh, will be every willing man who has skill for any kind of service. Also, the officers and all the people will wholly be at your command. So everything is set up. Everything is set up so that this glorious temple can be built. But the true tragedy is that it was destroyed probably about 500 years later, maybe 600 years. The temple and Jerusalem were destroyed, uh, were destroy, destroyed by the Babylonians, and then, in AD 70, they were destroyed again by Rome. This temple, where so much thought and prayer and love was put into its preparation, where there was so much huge financial sacrifice uh, devoted to its construction. It was glorious, and yet both were destroyed. And so... This passage, and as we understand the unfolding of God's program throughout history, and as we open up the rest of our Bibles, this passage, which seems so encouraging, is actually a powerful reminder 
that you cannot please God without Jesus. I want us to think about three doomed aspirations that David had for his son Solomon and ultimately he had for all Israel and yet they fell short of what God demanded. And the first was the presence of God. Uh, in verse 2 it says, Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God, and I made preparations for building. And so the ark of the covenant was supposed to be represent the footstool of God. It was effectively part of his throne. God in his mighty throne, his heavenly throne, was willing to place his footstool within this temple. And it was possible for people to approach the very house of God and know that they are in the presence of the living God. And yet, as I reminded you, that temple was destroyed. That temple no longer exists on earth today. We're reminded there that we're lost. We don't have a natural right to have direct access to the very throne room of God. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 3 verse 9. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. They have all turned aside. Altogether they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. That sounds like very extreme language. I mean, after all, there's plenty of religious people out there. Even if they're not members of good churches and they're not dedicated to Jesus, there are certainly plenty of people that believe in God. And there are certainly huge numbers of people that say that, uh, that devote their lives to serving God. And they, can, uh, they apparently do that in Islam and they apparently do that in various forms of Hinduism and Buddhism and all of these other religions. Are you saying that... There's not one of them that are righteous, that none of them are seeking after God. Well, they're all sinners, undoubtedly, but none of them. What does Paul say mean? He says that no one seeks for God. Surely all of these people are seeking for God. But the difficulty is that human nature is so broken and our relationship with our Heavenly Father is so distorted that we invent God's. We replace the true a living God who has revealed himself in the word of God with inventions of our own human minds. And we tend to bring God down to an earthly level, a way that we can comprehend a convenient God. And so we in the West, in our liberal West that thinks that everybody's as nice as I am, just assume that if there is a God, it's God's job to, uh, to bail us out in trouble. And when he doesn't bail us out of trouble, it's proof that he doesn't exist. And because he doesn't exist, we don't need to worry about him. But, that, but if he does exist, it means that we're all going to heaven when we die. And it doesn't really matter because God uh, is a nice God because I'm a nice person. And I'd want everybody to go to heaven. And that's it. That's an invented God. Or you come up with another, uh, another God, a God who's simple to understand, not a trinity, can't believe in that, that's too, too difficult to understand. No, he's a nice, simple God because he's just one and uh, you, you can place that God in your debt by if you do enough good things and he's obliged to uh, give you paradise like the Muslims believe. And all of these things are just inventions of the human mind. However, God has revealed himself. The Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune nature of the God of the Bible, who he has revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ. That God, curiously, doesn't seem very appealing to non-Christians and non-believers. And that's the point that Paul is making here. Nobody has a right access to the presence of God as was represented to us and to all of humanity in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of God. It was lost. Another aspiration that people have is for a loving, a loyal heart. And yet again, we 
fall short of that. This is another verse that I'd underline in my Bible. And you, my Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But, and here's the tragedy, it's that but. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. What seems like such an incredibly encouraging uh, verse suddenly ends up massively discouraging. Because if the holy, holy, holy God who says to us, you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your strength, all of your mind, and every faculty of your being is to be dedicated to the love of God, the triune God of the Bible. How many of us can genuinely say that we have attained that throughout the whole of our lives, that we have lived a life of unrelenting sacrifice and adoration and glorification of the eternal God? We all fall fall short of that standard. We are all lost sinners. We are all unable to do, uh, to obey the, what Jesus called the greatest commandment of all. We fall short of that. And therefore, we fall under this. If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. You and I know the wandering of our hearts. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep doing the things you do not want to do. You know that experience if you're honest with yourself. And maybe as we sang that verse, uh, um, um, as we sang, uh, Come thou fount of every blessing, maybe that line jumped out at you. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Why is it that we do that? There's something fundamentally corrupt in our hearts that leads us away from the ultimate good that we find in Jesus Christ and the Lord our God alone. And we end up replacing our love for God with a love for a lion, a love for an, uh, um, something nice from the shops, a love for the respect of other people, the love for all sorts of other things, a hobby or whatever else it is that draws us away from the love of God. Our hearts wander away from that true dedication that we truly owe to God. Thirdly, a wonderful aspiration is to do God's will. But again, we fall short of that as well. Then David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. Isn't that wonderful? I hope that that's underlined in your Bible as well. What a great encouragement to us. There's those times when we're feeling wavering or doubting. And it's good to know that God is with us. And to hear that command from God himself, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you till the work of the service of the house of the Lord is finished. But despite that, we fall short again. And why is it that the emphasis is on being strong and courageous when we don't do those things? It's quite an intimidating thing to be completely loyal to God. Paul was very honest about his own personal struggles with sin. And maybe this rings true with you. Paul in Romans 7 says, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do the thing I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want. I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, 
It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And that, that is the tragedy of our fallen uh, uh, nature. But, but, but we have Jesus. And with Jesus, everything changes. And these depressing passages that make us feel wretched and small and low, make us feel like, uh, like failures, are suddenly gloriously transformed. They suddenly become a great encouragement and the full nourishment and blessing that, that, that are offered to us in these verses suddenly become a reality. So let's think about three things that Christ has done for us. Christ gives us the presence of God. And where once people had to gather around the Ark of the Covenant, the footstool of the Lord our God, in the hope of experiencing something of the presence of God. You need to remember that that was only ever temporary. Jeremiah, writing just prior to the destruction of uh, the tabernacle, sorry, of the temple of Solomon by the Babylonians, he prophesied this. He said, when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land, in those days, declares the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. I do find it puzzling that there are some Christians out there that seem to think that we ought to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm often puzzled why. Because what are you going to put in there? What's the point of having the, uh, the temple of the Lord without the Ark of the Covenant there? If it, without the footstool, you have no guarantee that God would even be there. And yet, Jeremiah was saying that there would come a time when the people of God wouldn't even miss the Ark of the Covenant. Why is it that you and I as Christians don't miss the Ark of the Covenant? It's because we have Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwell there means to pitch a tent or to dwell in a tent. He tabernacled among us. Jesus became the very tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God among men. And wherever Jesus is, we have the presence of God. And so Christ dwells in our own hearts. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? And what does God's spirit do? He unites us to, to Christ and we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have something infinitely greater than just a mere Ark of the Covenant or a temple that can be destroyed. You have access to the eternal temple of God. You have access to the true tabernacle of, of God among men, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. You have Christ within you, the hope of glory. And I love this verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. It says, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord your God, and I... Paul was writing this, I'm with you in spirit. And the power of the Lord Jesus is present. What a lovely, lovely verse. When we meet in this building, praise God for this building, praise God for, for having somewhere like this to meet. But it's not the building that is the presence of God. It's when we meet together, when you are assembled together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I am with you in spirit, the power of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is present here. We assemble in the presence of our glorious God. And Jesus is with us. Dear brothers and sisters, how precious it is that we don't have to travel across the world. But God is a living reality with us. Secondly, a loving and loyal heart. Again, we remember that that commission that Solomon was to serve with a whole heart and a willing mind. But he fell short of that. 
We all do. But here was the presence of God. Again, we go back to that time, just around the time when the temple was about to destroyed, be destroyed by the Babylonians. And this time it's Ezekiel. A promise made to Ezekiel, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. A heart to love God. This would be the distinctive mark of the true people of God. The true people of God have always been uh, defined by those that love the Lord God from the heart. In Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews picks up on that. This is the covenant that I will make in those days, declares the Lord. I will put their laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And then a couple of verses later, he says, let us draw near with a true heart, with full assurance, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What a wonderful thing that is, that we also have with Christ a true heart, renewed, born again, refreshed, and able to love God, not because we are worthy, but because Jesus is worthy, because we are beloved in him. And so look at the rest of that verse in Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Yes, we can acknowledge, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But we can go back to God again and again and we say, here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And so with that renewed heart, we gain the ability through Christ, the ability to do God's will. David will have that charge to Solomon, be strong and courageous and do it. But now we have an ability to do what God calls us to do. Why? Because of what Jesus did. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus came in complete obedience to the law of God, to fulfill everything that he demanded to win for us eternal life. And then we have this glorious contrast, for by one man's disobedience, disobedience of Adam and in Adam we all fall short of the glory of God many were made sinners so by one man the Lord Jesus Christ's obedience many will be made righteous it's the obedience of Jesus Christ to the will of God that makes us righteous we're covered in the righteousness of Christ a gift that we do not deserve that covers all our failures and sins and makes us right in the presence of God and with that renewed heart and that renewed confidence we return to God in love and adoration. We look at Jesus, although he was a son in Hebrews 5, it says, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And now, in that, on the basis of that new relationship with God, we love God. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not because we need to put God in our debt and say, God, I've done enough good things, now you must pay me and reward me with eternal life. Not because we are proud and hypocritical, not because we can stand in judgment over people, other people and self-righteously say, at least I'm not as bad as him. But no, our whole relationship with God is radically changed and it's out of love for God that we long to become more like Christ. It's out of a desire to please Jesus that we start to obey his commands. And our relationship with God is radically changed. And with that new motivation to become more like Christ, our lives are set free from shame, degradation, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, judgmentalism. All of those things are inappropriate because we love God. We want to keep his commandments. So Paul is able to say, but thanks be to God 
that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to stand to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Lovely again. That relationship with God, that slavery to sin, that all of those failures, all of those frustrations and everything else that makes us feel wretched and small is transformed in Jesus. And we from the heart become obedient. We become obedient to the standard of teaching to which we are committed. Where do we find that standard of, of teaching? In the word of God the Bible. It's the word of God alone that acts as our sure foundation and leads us to Christ and then in Christ to new heartfelt obedience. So yes, we have enormous, wonderful blessings to learn from the temple of God. And as we finish 1 Chronicles and as we begin 2 Chronicles, we'll be looking in detail at this, this glorious temple that Solomon built but all the time we'll be looking beyond that temple to a greater temple so that we can understand the riches that we have in Jesus all the more and delight in that. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that in types and shadows, in glorious revelations of who you are, you showed to the world something of your true nature through David, in that temple built by Solomon. But we thank you and praise you that we have access now to something even better in Jesus Christ. Help us to love you more. Build us up, strengthen us, and enable us to, to love you and obey you from a heart full of love. Amen. So hope and pray that you're going to go back to that passage again and underline those passages and uh, really get the full blessing that God has intended for them. Now, we're going to sing God's praises in this, how wonderful is the Father's love. Let's remind ourselves of how wonderful God's love is and let's sing his praises in this, our final song.
so we cry Abba Father Those sufferings may fill our lives We're confident with ears with Christ And so we cry Abba Father Send his only son to rescue us. How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us. That he would send his only son to come and rescue us. How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us. pray that that was a blessing and a challenge for you. It's good for us to be reminded of how precious Jesus is. And I hope and pray that Jesus remains precious for you throughout the coming week. And may God be with you throughout it. Until next week, may God be with you. And now, will you say the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.